this is a, about the most indebted period period in the history of the world. Uh, I never thought I would see so much debt so quickly as we have seen in the last few months. So what we're really talking about is government debt, uh, because no one expects governments to go bankrupt, although uh, we all know that occasionally they do default. Uh, we've seen many cases of that, but certainly not, uh, you know, the United States or, or the UK or Spain or uh, uh, France. Uh, no one expects any of those countries to default anytime soon. But the way I think about that is uh, I use the debt to GDP ratio because debt is not automatically a problem. It may be a problem or it may not be a problem. It all depends on how much income or output you have to service the debt. So just to give a simple example, let's say you have a, a credit card and you have a, a $50,000 balance on your credit card. You owe the bank $50,000. Is that a problem? Well, if you make $20,000, uh, it's a big problem. You're probably going to go bankrupt. But if you make $200,000, you could probably, you know, write a check and pay it off. So the, the answer as to whether the debt is a problem or not has to, can only be thought about in relation to your income. And so I use the debt to GDP ratio. I say, how much debt does a country have? How much debt is outstanding? and how big is their GDP? And when you use that ratio, uh, if you're at say 30% or even 40%, that's a comfortable ratio. Yes, you have some debt, but you also have say a strong economy and your ability to service the debt by collecting taxes or other sources of revenue is, is very reasonable and that, that debt level is sustainable. Um, but when you get up to 60%, 60% happens to be the uh, level under the Maastricht Treaty where the members of the European Union are not supposed to have debt in excess of 60% of, the, of their GDP. Now, many of them do. Uh, I'm not saying this is a hard and fast rule, but that's, that's where uh, Angela Merkel gets a little bit upset when you're above 60%. And uh, Spain and France and, uh, and some other Italy certainly are, are above that threshold. But there's another threshold that's important, which is 90%. And 90% comes out of the research of Ken Rogoff and Carmen Reinhart. And what they've shown in developing markets, developed markets throughout the 20th century, recently in the distant past, no matter where they look, once a country gets above 90% debt to GDP, a couple things happen. Number one, uh, debt is no longer productive. Uh, the, the idea of borrowing is I'll, I'll, you know, I'll, uh, I'll borrow a dollar Dude, I am, I'm going to do something with that money. Huh? Yeah, I'll borrow the dollar, I'll spend the dollar, but I'll get a dollar twenty of GDP because you know I'll spend it on something, but then the recipient he'll spend it, and then someone else will spend it, and by by what's called velocity or the turnover of money, you'll actually get more than you borrow. That's Keynesian economics, very simplified version of it. Um, but what Rogoff and Reinhardt have shown is once you get past 90%, that's no longer true. You borrow a dollar and you spend a dollar, but you might only get 90 cents or 80 cents of GDP. In other words, you reach a point where you cannot borrow your way out of debt. You cannot borrow your way to get enough productivity to get out of debt. And then you're sort of in a, a doom loop or, or a death spiral. Well, I, I mentioned 30% is comfortable, 60% is a problem in Europe, 90% this is critical threshold. The United States today is at 106%, but we are very rapidly moving to 120%. When you take the additional $5 trillion of new deficit spending that the Congress has approved and put that on top, and bear in mind, the GDP has gone down, right? So your denominator is shrinking, your numerator is going up, which means the fraction is going up, and now it's, the debt is well in excess of 100%. It's actually coming into 120, 20%. So all of a sudden, the United States starts to look like Italy, or for that matter, Lebanon or, or Japan, which is, uh, is the highest of all. Now, the modern monetary theorists, MMT, modern monetary theory, whom I completely disagree with, I know, I know a lot of them. I know Stephanie Kelton. She's, she's a big brain. She's one of the thought leaders. She has a new book coming out. Uh, they say, uh, so what? They say it doesn't matter. Uh, that you can take your debt to GDP ratio to not only 100%, but 200%, or in theory, even 300%. It just doesn't matter for two reasons. Number one, you can always print the money to pay off the debt. Um, by the way, everything I'm talking about does not apply if you're borrowing in a different currency. If you're Argentina and you print uh, you know, pesos, but you're borrowing in dollars, that's a problem because you can't print dollars. 
But of course, the United States can print dollars. The ECB can print euros. Bank of Japan can print yen. And if that's the currency of your debt, you know, just print up the money. What, what's the problem?、Uh, and they have other solutions.、Um, you know, if,、uh, if inflation starts to take off, just raise taxes. I'm not so sure about that. You've, you've barred yourself into oblivion. And you get inflation, and you think you can tax your way out of it. That doesn't sound like a very good way to go. But the, but the bottom line is that. All these, all the countries, starting with the United States, but all the major developed countries, are now in these sky-high and rising debt-to-GDP ratios. Now the question is, what's going to happen next? Interest rates are extremely low. The central banks have made them low, so the debt service is not that great. The debt is huge, but if you're only paying, you know, a fraction of one percent, it's not. It's not as if you're. Incurring a lot of interest expense, which of course adds to the deficit. So that's the first thing. We don't have inflation. People who say that, you know, the money printing that the central banks are doing to buy the debt, which they are, is inflationary. That's not true. That's a, a, a kind of gross misunderstanding.、It、comes out of Milton Friedman, etc. It's it's not true. What does cause inflation is velocity, which is the turnover of money. People decide. People lose confidence in money. And they spend it, and someone else gets it, and they spend it. And everyone's spending it because they want to run into hard assets: land, gold, silver, fine art, real estate, you know, etc.、Um, or just buy a car because they think the price is going up, or a refrigerator, whatever it is. If you get that kind of velocity, inflation can can happen very quickly, and we saw this in the late 1970s. So the real warning is not that any of these countries are going to default on their debt. They're not going to default on their debt because they can print the money. The danger is inflation. Now, if you said, "Do I see inflation right now?" Absolutely not. We, we're going to see deflation, which is a different kind of danger. Deflation causes debt defaults because well, have, it, have, Japan has been trapped into that like for thirty years. Yeah, and Japan's been in a depression, in my view, since 1990.、Uh, the, 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 uh, my view, the U.S. has been in a depression since 2007. We're in our second lost decade. You know, Japan's entering their fourth lost decade. But it's as if all the countries in the world are getting more and more like Japan. I had a meeting with uh, uh, Saki Kibara-san. He was、uh, he was very famous in the 1980s. He was known as Mr. Yen. He was an assistant finance minister in Japan, but he was he was called Mr. Yen. A、uh, very smart guy, very nice guy, and I confronted him on this. I said, you know, Saki Kibara-san, you know, you your debt keeps going up, and your debt to GDP ratio is is sky high, and your GDP is is kind of flat. And he said, "Yes, but you're missing one thing." He said, "Our population is going down, which is true. So, on an overall basis, they're flat, but on a per capita basis, their GDP is actually outperforming."、Uh, so I said, "So the so the logic of that is someday there'll be one person left in Japan, and she will own the entire country and be the richest person in the world." Well, it's very bad for Argentina,、uh, and here's why: if you、uh, or Chile, for that matter, if you borrow in dollars. And then we have deflation. What does that mean? It means the value of cash is going up, but it also means the value of the debt is going up. So even if you have very low interest rates, which we do,、um, when you borrow in dollars and the dollar is worth more, that's what deflation is. Your dollar is worth more. That means your debt is also、uh, worth more, meaning you owe more debt in real terms. The nominal debt's the same. So if you borrow a hundred million, you owe a hundred million. That doesn't change. But if you have deflation, So that the hundred million is actually more valuable. See, people, this hasn't happened since the 1930s. People don't understand. No, no one alive has really lived through a strong deflationary period. A lot of us have experience with inflation. We had it in the United States in the late 70s, and you're right, Argentina has had it on multiple occasions, and and we can name other countries. People have a sense of what to do in inflation, but no one alive has experienced serious deflation. Since the 1930s,、uh, and if you did, you were you're, you're 95 years old today. So,、um, so people don't really understand it. But one of the things it does, it makes the the real value of debt go up. So in real terms, you owe more money. So if you were in trouble to begin with, and you borrowed money to get out of trouble, but the value of the debt goes up, now you owe more money. Now where do you stand? You, it, it, this is. Uh, it, it may not show up in interest payments, but it, but it may, every dollar becomes more and more difficult to get. The dollar is worth more. So what it means is that you see a strong dollar now. Your local currency、uh, could be weaker against the dollar. That's true. That could help exports. It could help tourism. So you、yeah, know, there's no tourism right now. 
There's yeah, not going well, to be more tourism. Well, 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 you make a good point. There is no tourism today. I'm, I'm on a mountain and you're, uh, you know, you're in a, a home or studio or someplace. So, right, there's no tourism going on today. But assuming it comes back next year, if, if you have a really strong dollar, in theory, you know, an American could, or European for that matter, could look at Argentina. You know, I, I've been to Argentina many times. It's one of the most beautiful countries in the world. And, you know, nice people, great restaurants. So, but it could look uh, kind of like a bargain to somebody with, with a very strong currency. Sure. But that's not really Argentina's problem. Argentina needs, Argentina needs more high tech industry, more high value added industry. It needs to break out of what's called the, the middle income trap where you, you get to a certain point but you can't get past that point because you can't just do it with uh, assembly style manufacturing jobs. Uh, you uh, you need high value added jobs. You need technology is what you need. And uh, all the developed economies are facing the same that, issue. That applies to all Latin America, Chile, Mexico, Colombia. Correct, but it applies to most of Asia as well. This is uh, China's problem. China is not going to continue the kind of growth we've seen over the last 20 years because they, they've used up that uh, you know, when I, I studied uh, development economics in the 1970s at, in graduate school, and we used to think that the hard part of development economics was getting from low income to middle income. And then we say, if you get to middle income, it's a straight path to high income. Turns out that's not true. Getting from low income to middle income is actually pretty straightforward. You have to get rid of corruption and you need to ease up on regulation. But you can, if you have foreign direct investment and um, people come from the country to the cities and you do, uh, you know, kind of simple manufacturing, et cetera, you can get a really good export machine going and, and earn hard currency reserves. So that part's easy. The hard part is getting from middle income to high income, because it turns out you can't just do more of the same. You actually need more high value added. You need technology today, and, and that's what I would advise every country to be to be working on, um, including Argentina, where the, the Argentina has a very uh, very highly educated workforce. I mean, Argentina would be a good case to uh, why don't we make uh, you know iPhones in uh, in Argentina instead of China, uh, and and we're, we're going to bust up the United States is going to bust up the supply chain to China. We're going to we're going to shut over time. Won't happen overnight, but we're going to pull those factories out or shut them down and move them elsewhere. So the question is, if I were advising any developing economy, I would say, how, how can I become a supplier to the United States? If they're going to get rid of China, which we are for a lot of reasons, I'd want to be in the list. And we're actually looking at Jordan as a country that um, has could make cell phones. Um, uh, India is a big case because they have cheap labor. Argentina, I think is a better candidate because they just because they have a more highly educated workforce.